Hello, my students. Saxon Advanced Mathematics, lesson 41. Welcome back to life after Thanksgiving. I hope you had a great break-ish, right? Break from your other classes, not a break from me, um, but a holiday, right? It was a holiday for sure. So I hope that you had an enjoyable time. And I'm excited to share with you that we have two weeks of new lessons left, right? I'm dropping 41 to you right now, 42 will be close behind, and we just have two weeks before we review on the 14th, my video that I send you two weeks from now will be a review, there will be homework with that, and then Wednesday I will be dropping off at your home the midterm and you will have 24 hours in which to take it. It is not a take home exam. It is not an open book exam. Take home meaning in the old sense of exams. Sometimes we call exams where you could use all the resources. Um, a take home exam, it's not like that. I will ask you to close your books, put all your notes away. So make sure you memorize your formulas as you're preparing for this. Um, but it will be 10 problems taken directly from the homework. And I will tell you more about that when we get to the review day. I'll tell you exactly where to, how to study. So prepare for that two weeks out. Um, and while I have the Wednesday date here is the date of the midterm, I will drop it off to you midday on Wednesday and I will pick it up from you in the afternoon of Thursday. That will be what, the 17th. So you'll have quite a bit of time to fit it into your schedule. All right, let's talk about the subject at hand. Um, and I'll be talking more about that as we go. Um, lesson 41 has two topics, both of which build very strongly on subjects we've studied before. Reciprocal trig functions. Okay, we know quite a bit about trig functions, but we know a lot about reciprocals. A reciprocal is built by taking any fraction, I'm going to call it x over y, and flipping it. Right? I simply took the denominator and numerator and flipped them, right? Um, so we say these two are reciprocals of each other, and we've been using them for quite a few years to solve different jobs in our equations when we simplify, um, and expressions as well. Um, then we learned another way to look at reciprocals. We learned also that if you say that, um, let's say that x is your value, then one over x is the reciprocal, right? Or we could say to take this idea and take it into something that looks a little more like that, x over y and one over x over y. Mm, this is how we looked at it when we did it in lesson 22 this year. We talked about reciprocal functions, and we said you take the original, the parent function, and you put it over one. And we go, now wait a minute, which is it? Do you form the reciprocal of this by flipping it, or do you solve the reciprocal, do you find the reciprocal by putting it over one? Well, take your complex fractions hat out, put it on your head, and say, okay, how would we resolve this complex fraction? Uh, we'd multiply by the reciprocal, right? That would turn it into xy over xy, which equals one. That means we can blow up the whole denominator. But if we're gonna multiply the bottom by this, then we have to multiply the top by this. One times y over x equals y over x. And that's exactly what we had before. Okay, so whether we form the, the reciprocal by putting the fraction over underneath a one, right? Put the one and then the, the old function, if you will, or the old value, that's the same thing as flipping it, okay? So we can kill two birds with the same stone. So reciprocals are not a threat. And like I said, in lesson 22, we were graphing things like the f of x equals two to the x, and the g of x equals one over two to the x. And we were looking at the different uh, ways that the graphs would shake out 
um, when you take a function and flip it like that. Um, yes, I think we were doing it even simpler. I think we were doing and f of x and g of x equals one over x. So these were reciprocal functions. We did this one too, but this was later. We started with the very simple one. So we have quite a body of knowledge about reciprocals that we're bringing to bear on what we're learning in this lesson. Okay, then we know a decent amount about trig functions, right? We have our friendly trig functions. Um, we've got sine, cosine, and tangent. Um, let me do something. Ignore that. I wanna put a little more space in between my words so that you can see more clearly what I'm going to write. It's very empowering to just rip that page out and throw it to the side. Okay, sine, cosine, and tangent. I'm skipping more lines in between. That's all I'm doing differently. Okay, and we know we have a little jingle that helps us remember this, right? Oscar had a hold over Arthur. There they are fighting in the alley, right? Oscar's up on top of Arthur and he's just choking the heck out of him and it's a terrible scene. But it's helpful to us because it helps us remember. Now, according to this reciprocal speech I just gave you, we should be able to create the reciprocals of these functions by simply putting them over a one. So if we take one and put it over sine, which is also equal as we just proved to writing it like that, right? These, these two are the same, both of them are the reciprocal to this. That's the reciprocal function, and this is what we call the parent, right? Um, that is the reciprocal function of sine, but here's the very nifty fun thing. We give it a lovely name, okay? Just as we've named these, we have names, nifty names, for the reciprocal functions. And this one, the reciprocal of sine, we call cosecant, and we abbreviate it CSC. Hmm, okay, weird, right? Now let's try cosine. To find the reciprocal, we would put one over cosine, or we could just flip it. We know that that works as well. And this one we call secant, and abbreviate it S-E-C. Okay, we'll use the abbreviations, but I want you to know what they stand for. And then tangent, same thing. One over tangent, this is a bigger line, or we can just flip it and we call that cotangent. And that is C-O-T, is how we abbreviate that one. All right, now everyone gets confused because how do you remember which one's cosecant and which one's secant? It seems confusing because in some ways you think, well, shouldn't the cosines be together? Heads up, no, we don't want the cosines together. So the reciprocal function that says cosecant goes with sine, and the one that says just plain secant goes with cosine. Interesting pattern with the names, right? Sine and cosine secant and cosecant. We're gonna get to that later. These names all have a really cool explanation of why they are the way they are. But for your purposes, I just remembered that the reciprocal functions don't have matching letters. The S does not go with the S, the S goes with the C. And vice versa, cosine starts with a C and it goes with secant, the S. All right, so just remember the letters should not match up. And then cotangent is just a lovely little friend. He's easy to match, right? Tangent, cotangent. That makes much more sense. Now, how do we use these? Um, how do we use the reciprocal functions? Well, here's the thing. 
in most types of problems, we don't really need these because we can solve them using just the basic parent functions. And these are just kind of fancy bells and whistles. But we're going to practice using them just so we get used to them and they don't scare us. Um, so keep that in mind that we use the parent functions in all kinds of different interesting problems. The reciprocals, not so much. We're just practicing them so that we're used to them. Diving in. Make sure that you memorize. Um, I'm gonna give you something else to memorize later. This is helpful to memorize, but there's a lot of information there. I'm gonna give you a condensed version of it later. All right, draw the appropriate triangles and evaluate secant of 330 degrees plus cotangent of 480. Okay, we're used to doing problems like this. We can handle the fact that this is greater than 360, right? It's got an extra spin in it, that's fine. Um, we know how to draw pictures. We know how to find the sides with using our reference triangles. The only thing that's gonna be weird is that the ratios we're gonna build are a little bit different. So let's draw some pictures. 330, that's positive, so it's gonna be there in the fourth quadrant, right? 90, 180, 270, and then we need 60 more. So this angle will be 30 degrees, which makes sense because it's the last 30 is what we add to it to get 360, right? So this is a 30 degree, this is a 60 degree angle. There's our right angle. Now let's put our reference numbers on. This is the original side. This is the side that got chopped in half, and then this is what was the middle of the triangle, right? If I imagine my reference triangle like so, if I imagine the full equilateral, which is the way my brain always thinks of it. All right, so secant, we can use, we can use the chart, but let's just think it through. Secant starts with an S, so its reciprocal function is cosine, which is a hold, but we want the reciprocal, so we know that secant equals h over a. I just flip it, right? So that tells me that what we want for our angle here is the hypotenuse 2 over the adjacent side, which is square root of 3. All right, I'm probably going to have to rationalize that. Um, And here's the thing. I'm gonna to have to rationalize that. We'll get to that in a minute. The signs for the reciprocal functions are the same as their parent functions. So this information is the same. I'm gonna draw my chart right here. Plus, 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 minus, plus, minus. Okay, so cosine in the fourth quadrant is positive. Tells me that right here, right? Cosine in the fourth quadrant is positive. We keep these in order, sine, cosine, tangent. So this is my final value. I am not going to rationalize it yet. I wanna see what I get for the other one. Now we'll go to cotangent. Now this is more than 360. So what I'm gonna do, I'm not even gonna draw the picture. I'm just gonna subtract 360 and see what we have left, 120. Okay, so that tells me it's going to be in the second quadrant, right? Let's double check after we'll draw this, 90, and then it won't go all the way to 180. It will go 30 more. So that will be a 60 degree angle, right? This is 60 degrees, because if I add 60 to the 120, I get the full 180, right? This much is the 120, this is my 60. Okay, good. 30, now let's try and get our perspective in so we can write in the, the sides of our reference triangle. This is the original side, that's two. This is the side that was chopped in half, it's one and this is square root of three. Tangent 
is over Arthur. So cotangent is the other way around, right? I'm not using my chart, I'm just using my logic to keep this straight. Okay, so that means that the cotangent is the adjacent, which is one, over the opposite, which is square root of three. Okay, so now we have a value for the secant of 330, and we have a value for the cotangent of 480, and what we have to do is add them. So it's two over square root of three plus one over square root of three equals three over square root of three. Oh, I forgot to check my sign on this. That's important, isn't it? Um, tangent in the second quarter, ooh, this is a good catch, right? Tangent in the second quarter, quadrant is negative. So I'm actually subtracting here, aren't I? This is negative square root of three. So two minus one is actually one over the square root of three. And then for our final answer, we will rationalize that denominator. And our final answer will be square root of three over three. It's a positive result this particular, this part of it was negative, right? I squeezed it in right there. All right. That's the right answer. Yay. Checking the signs on these is always, it's just one extra step, you guys. And it's, it's easy to forget that. So just remember that's part of the package. What helps me is to get that diagram on the page sooner rather than later. Okay, let's try another one. There are three of these. No, I lied, there are four. Example 41.2. Draw the approximate triangles to evaluate. Oh gosh, John's gonna make it so exciting. Ready? It's more than you can handle. Look what he's done. Not only has he given us a fraction as a coefficient, He's giving us the angle measurements in rads. All right, fine, we can do it. We can handle this, you guys. He can throw us everything but the kitchen sink and we're still gonna be fine. Okay, so these are our trig functions, or our reciprocal functions. We're gonna remember that. We're gonna remember the letters are opposite to the, the parent functions they represent. We remember that for radians, all we need to do is drop in 180 into the place of pi. And we know right off the bat that 180 divided by four equals 45, right? Dividing it by two gives us 90s and then we divide those in half. So that's gonna be helpful to us, right? All right, so let's write those angles as degrees. So this cancels to 45. 45 times 3 is 90. It's 135, right? I took the 45 and I multiplied it in my head by 3. All right, 5, 12, 13. Okay, good. Got that, right? Okay, minus, that's in the problem. Double checking, yes, secant. Oh, and this should have parentheses around it as well. Now we know that pi over four is 45, so it's 45 times 11, which is, multiplying by 11 is always fun. It looks like that, right? And that is 495, Okay, I'm gonna write that down. That's positive 495. This one was a negative angle measurement. This one is positive. But we see right away that that's larger than 360, so that's got an extra spin in it, right? So we're gonna subtract 360 to get rid of that first trip around, and we'll see we get, what, 135. Okay, so this means that our angle measurement is actually 135 positive. This is 135 negative. Okay. Whew. Are you dizzy yet? <coughs> Excuse me. It's kind of crazy. 
All right, negative 135 is going to land us in the third quadrant. Let's double check. We're going backwards. So here's 90, here's 180. Okay, so we don't need to go that far. Here's 90 and then we need 45 more. Beautiful, so it looks like this. It's one, one, square root of two. And these are both 45 degrees. I like to just write that reference triangle right into my picture. John always shows them separately and it's just confusing. Okay, so now let's figure out what cosecant means. Well, we know the letters are opposite. So this is the reciprocal function of secant, right? Which is, or I'm sorry, sine. Secant is another reciprocal function. This guy is partners with either sine or cosine, and we know it's gotta be sine because this starts with a C, and we need the one with an S. So sine is Oscar had, so cosecant is the opposite, right? So this is what we want. Okay, and that would be, in this case, the hypotenuse is the square root of two over the opposite, we're here. Hypotenuse over the opposite is one. Now let's write our sign chart, positive negative sign, not that sign. Plus, 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 minus, plus, minus. Okay, and we're in the third quadrant and we're dealing with cosecant, so that's buddies with sine, and so it is a negative value in the third quadrant. Got it? Okay, so that means that's our value. Okay, I'm just gonna calculate these values first. This value is that. Um, I'll, I'll just write it in so we don't get confused. Then my next step will be to multiply two-thirds times minus square root of two over one, right? And then we'll subtract, and now let's figure out what this is. All right, positive 135 this time, so we're in the, we're in the second quadrant, right? Because this much would be 90, and then we'd need another 45. Ignore that line. It's just an intruder. Right, this much would be the 135. This is the other 45 that would help us total 180. So this is one, one, square root of two. I'm not gonna put the, well, I guess I will. Go ahead and put the degrees in. Um, okay, so we're now set up. We've got our triangle in place. That all looks good. Now this is a reciprocal function, so who's his friend, his parent? His parent starts with the C, so it's cosine. Cosine is a hold, so that tells us that secant, the reciprocal little friend, must be ha, right? This one's ho and this one's ha. Um, although I don't like to say that because it's just super confusing, but anyway, um, oh wait, yes, this is right. Um, I got all confused and excited there for a minute. All right, so, 135, the secant is the hypotenuse, which is the square root of two, over the adjacent, which is one. Huh, looks a lot like the other one, doesn't it? So, this time, and no, we have to check the sign. We're talking about secant, which is buddies with cosine, and we're in the second quadrant. Here's my chart. Cosine in the second quadrant is negative. So this needs to be a negative. All right, this negative stays the same. Uh, I don't have a coefficient on this side, so it's just minus, and then I'll write it again over here, minus square root of two over one. Oh, hmm, that's interesting. These combine, here I'll go around, those become a plus. So let's multiply this together. It's minus two square root of two, right? Pigs with pigs, wolves with wolves, they stay separate, over three plus square root of two over one. Hmm, 
All right, that looks good. That looks interesting. Now I'd like to combine these and I see that the radicals match and I get excited about that. So we're gonna have to get the denominators matching. So this one's gonna need to be multiplied by three over three, right? So I'm gonna squeeze the three in there and then the three there, right? Adjusting that. Now we're ready to combine. The denominators match, so that will stay the same. This is minus two and a plus three. The radicals match so we can ignore them. Minus two and plus three is positive one. I don't have to write it down. I can just write the radical and that is the right answer. Oh my gosh, was that exciting? It's so many steps, you guys. It's so many steps. Um, and there's lots of little pieces, right? We have to remember the coefficients. We have to deal with the, the reciprocals. We have to deal with the radicals. We have to deal with the signs. Whew, it's a lot. Or the radians, I'm sorry. I call those radicals, but they're radians. Um, we have to deal with radicals too, though, don't we? So there are so many moving pieces. We are juggling so many balls at one time, which is why you should just take a minute right now if you even followed that remotely and go, holy cow, I'm getting ridiculously smart. Go take a break if you need to. Put me on pause and go tell your mother, did you know you're raising a genius? Because you are. But I will carry on. You can pause me if you want to do that. Frankly, I think it would be a lovely time for a drink of water or something. Let's try another one. All right, draw the appropriate triangles and evaluate. Secant of 10 pi over three plus cosecant, here we go, it's gonna get crazy, minus seven pi over two. All right. Well, where do we start with this? We're gonna to need to know our reciprocal functions, but we don't need a chart for that. We can figure that out in our heads. We need to remember that pi equals 180, and it's gonna help us if we remember that pi over three equals 60, and pi over two equals 90. That's gonna be helpful. Uh, we're gonna need our positive negative chart Okay, I make sure I've got that on every page. Uh, okay, so let's start here and we'll fix the degrees first. Later, we're gonna get so comfortable that we're gonna say, let's just work this in radians, but we're not there yet and we can just fix that right away. Pi over three equals 60. When we fix that, it will become 600, right? This cancels, it becomes 60, we multiply it by 10. 600 degrees. Well, that's gonna bear some subtracting, right? Plus the cosecant of, and this is gonna have a minus sign in front of it, pi over two is 90, so then we take 90 times seven, minus 630 degrees. Okay, let's clean those degree measurements up. Let's take the extra spins out, right? So let's subtract 360 from this, and we get what? Five, oh no, we leave that there. That's four, 240 degrees. And this, it's gonna be negative, but we're subtracting the 360 from the 630. 270, so it will be minus 270, right? The, the minus sign stays, we just simplify it, all right? So now we can say it's the secant of 240 plus the cosecant of minus 270. We need the parentheses around the minus sign. It's okay to write a positive value without the parentheses, but the negatives need that in front of it. All right, here we go secant of 240, 240, what quadrant is that? That would be in the third, right? 90, 180, 270 is all the way, but I don't want all of it, I just want 60. 
right? So this is my 60 degree angle. And this is my 30 degree. This is the one that's still long. This is the one I chopped in half. That's the other one, okay? Secant is buddies with cosine because that's the opposite letter. So cosine equals a hold. So secant equals that flipped. This is the one we want. That just helped us get there. My marker is giving up the ghost. Let me switch him out. All right, so the secant of this angle, this 240 degrees that we've chopped down to a 60, we want the hypotenuse, which is two over the adjacent, which is one. All right. And then we're dealing with cosine in the third quadrant right there. It is negative. Just following along, we're looking good. Okay, uh, cosecant of minus 270. Okay, minus 270, that means we're going Ah, wait a minute. We look at this and go, that's a quadrantal angle, isn't it? That is a quadrantal angle. So that means we are, let's see, it would be 90, 180, 270. So it would be like this. It's kind of in the first quadrant, but it's right up here, right? It's like that, because if we're counting our degrees, it's 90, 180, 270. It's right here. And cosecant is friends with sine. So cosecant would be the hypotenuse over the opposite. Okay, so at this one, the measured here, the opposite side is, sine refers to the y value, right? Sine is associated with y. Cosine is associated with x. So our y value is pretty much 1, and our hypotenuse is always 1. So that means the cosecant at this quadrangle angle is 1. Hmm, okay. And that means that all we have to do to simplify this, we're adding... Oh, let me just double check. Sine in the first quadrant or right here is positive, right? Sine is positive in both of those. So it would be positive one. And that means we just have minus two plus one. So our final answer is minus one. Isn't it crazy that a problem that's as complicated as this can boil down to such a simple answer? Hmm. What we're doing seems very valuable, even though we don't yet understand exactly what the point is of all of this. We're just learning to manipulate all this information and combine these ratios. That's what we're doing, right? We're, we're creating ratios and then combining them. Okay, one more, and then we're gonna switch topics dramatically. Ready? Example 41.0. Four. Draw the appropriate triangles and evaluate cotangent of 17 pi over 6. That looks like a crazy one. Minus square root of 6 times cosecant. I'm doing it again. I'm saying out loud what I'm doing. Okay, John has started working the problems in radians. He doesn't automatically shift to degrees. I do not expect that of you yet. I am 100% fine with you continuing to adjust these to degrees right away and um, working them in that mode. So uh, the solutions manual might not be super, super helpful, but just remember you can translate any step by remembering that pi equals 180 
And here we're gonna need pi over six, which we can see that would be 30, and pi over four, which we did in an earlier problem, that's 45. All right, so that's helpful to us because it helps us reduce these really fast. Let's do that first. Cotangent, it will be pi over six is 30, so then we'll have to take the 30 and multiply it by 17. 17 by 30, 21, that'll be 510 degrees. Okay, and then let's just right away subtract the 360. That becomes 11 minus six is 150 degrees. That'll be our cotangent value minus square root of six times the co, whoops, co -c -cant. Let's fix this. Pi over four is 45, so we need 45 times nine. Here. I think it's great for you to do your calculations like this, but I don't wanna confuse you by having a scribbly page. 45 times nine, this is 45 again. 36 plus four is 40, and then we'll subtract the 360 to get 45 degrees, but it's negative. So that's what we've got. Whew. Okay, got those degrees taken care of, that's good news. We've got them simplified for the extra spins now we want to figure out what quadrant these are going to be in. 150, that will be in the second quadrant, right? Because we'll go 90. We don't need all of 180. From the 90, we just need another 60. So this will become our 30 degree angle. And that's our 60, whoops, 60. Um, double check this, yes, 150 plus 30 gives us 180. That I'm convinced that that's right. This is our two, this is our one, this is our square root of three. Cotangent is friends with tangent. Tangent is over Arthur, so cotangent is the opposite of that. Remember, we don't need to memorize those reciprocal functions as if they're something new. We can remember them based on their relationships with the parent functions that we know so well. So I'm here. The adjacent side is square root of three. The opposite side is one. And what's the sine of tangent in the second quadrant? Let's jot that up here. Oops. I got excited and did this on the other side. Okay, tangent in the second quarter is negative. So this is a negative square root of three. Okay, beautiful, we're good. Now, then that has no coefficient. So then we're gonna do minus square root of six and I'm gonna put it over one and then we'll calculate this value right here and we'll put that in there. All right, so Kosi, you can't, wow, you can't really read that, can you? Um, minus 45 degrees, that tells me fourth quadrant. It's right down the middle, right? I'm cool with the 30, 60, 90, the 30, 60, 90 triangle, but I love the 45. It's so cute and simple. One, one square root of two. Cosecant is friends with sine. Sine is Oscar had, so this is hypotenuse over opposite. Hypotenuse is square root of two. Opposite is one. So this is square root of two over one. But what is the value of sine in the fourth quadrant? It is negative, so that becomes a negative. Hmm, <laughs> okay. I like it. 
Now let's simplify all of this. Okay, I see that we don't have fractions anywhere, so I'm just gonna delete all those ones, but I'm gonna do some multiplying here, right? Because we're multiplying that. So it's gonna be minus square root of three, then this is gonna give me a plus square root of 12. And that looks like a dead end until I remember, oh, four gives me a root in here with a pair of twos that I can pull out. So that's gonna be minus square root of three plus pair of pigs in equals a single guy on the outside, two square root of three. Now my radicals match. And I can see that this is a minus one, right? Minus one plus two gives me a positive one. So my answer is just square root of three. You're a genius. I'm telling you, those are really hard problems. Will there be one on the midterm? Yeah, you better believe with whatever else we've added to it at that time. But this is good stuff. Okay, this is a huge part of what this year is focused on is this whole trig function mashup. And we're mashing it good. All right, let's change topics, shall we? To something that is, ah, I think it's easier, although I kind of, I kind of dig those trig functions, you guys. I won't lie. We're gonna talk about permutations again. And we've talked about the fact that these problems, right, take the letters and the word equal and find out how many ways you can arrange them in seven boxes or whatever, that's not right. But you know what I mean, those permutation problems, how many ways. One of the things I've told you about them that can be frustrating is that there's no formula, there's no standard way to approach them. And I lied to you a little bit. There is a formula, but most students find the formula to be even more confusing than just figuring out each problem in your head. So what we're gonna do this time is we're going to figure out how to derive a formula and how we're gonna write that. So this is called permutation notation. Let's start with a specific problem and then we'll work backwards into the formula. How many permutations of their of 22 things taken six at a time. Okay, and we're assuming in all of these that there's no replacement because what we're assuming is that these things are physical things. So we can't just keep choosing the same one over and over again, right? They're, they're physical objects. So we know, okay, that you take a box, you divide it into six compartments to represent the six things you're taking at a time. And the first one, you can choose any one. Now you've given one up. Now you've given up two, right? We know this pattern. Okay. So that we know is the answer, and if we multiply it all out, it's some crazy number. What is it? 53 million, 721,360. Okay, that's, we hardly even care about that in this problem because what we're really trying to do is find the formula. Now, what we're gonna do is we're going to assign variables. N equals the number of things, right? And in our case, it's equal to 22. R is the letter we're going to use for the um, R stands for um, how many at a time. And in our case, it's six, our case, okay? So what we do is we say the permutation of 22 things taken six at a time. Notice how I wrote the numbers on either side of that. That's the form we're gonna use in this notation. Equals 22 times 21 times 20 times 19 times 18 times 17. I got squishy. 
Now, we're gonna try and restate these numbers in terms of n. The first one is n. Then we're gonna multiply it by n minus one, right? 21 is equal to n minus one. Then we're gonna multiply it by n minus two, n minus three, n minus four, n minus five, okay? Notice that this last subtraction is one number off from six. It's always gonna be that way because we're taking six things, but the first one we don't have to subtract from, right? So whenever we're taking r at a time, the last value will not be equal to r, it'll be one bigger than r, all right? So the way we can create a formula out of this is to say, if we wanna find the permutation of n things taken r at a time, we will multiply n times n minus one times n minus two and so on until we get to n minus the number of things plus one. And notice this is exactly, I'm sorry, this shouldn't be a six, this should be an r. I'm trying to globalize it, right? This will allow us to get the right number of factors. It should, part of us thinks, no, it should be, it should, there should be six of them, but we've already got one that doesn't have any subtractions. So that's why this last one is weird, okay? So this is the formula we can use for solving permutations, all right? That's why we've been drawing it in boxes because this is kind of heinous looking, isn't it? Okay. Now John wants us to do something else that th that's theoretical and weird. I'm gonna copy this on the top of my next page. Okay, we said that the permutation of n things taken r at a time is equal to n times n minus one, right? We just subtract as we go to each box, n minus two, dot, 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 and so on, until you get to n minus r, but then you add one back because this first one doesn't have a subtraction. That, this first one counts. I don't know how to say that any better. I hope you know what I'm talking about. If not, we'll have a chat during the, the video this week, or the um, FaceTime chat. Okay, so, how can we use this? This next one, this next problem is, it's a show how it can be calculated using the concept of factorial. All right, using the previous example. And there's one more after this that's much more practical. Okay, so what we're doing is we're saying, okay, if we're, we have 22 items taken six at a time, then we know that we're gonna be multiplying 22 times, I'll just write it out, 22 minus one times 22 minus two times 22 minus three. We know we have to get all the way down to, our plus one Twenty two in this case, it will be to use this formula. We know that our smallest we can calculate that n minus r plus one is going to be equal to twenty two minus six plus one, which is equal to what this is sixteen plus one is seventeen. So we need to keep going until we get to seventeen. We're at nineteen now, right? Right? Twenty two, twenty one, twenty, nineteen. Here comes eighteen, twenty two minus four. And then the last one will be 22 minus five. That should give us 17. That's using this little formula, right? This, these are all multiplied together. I just ran out of room. So if we wanna write these as factorials, we could write it as 22 times 21 times 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times 
16 factorial, right? That takes care of everything else that we don't want to include. And then we would divide this by 16 factorial. And another way to see that is, look, it's 22 minus 6. Or, in our case, n minus r. Huh. Factorial, we have to put that on there too, right? So, to simplify this formula even better, we can say we take n factorial and we divide it by n minus r factorial. This is the best formula for finding permutations. This one is bulky and has a long blah tail, right? That's why we don't like it. But we have to do this one last step using factorials to simplify. This formula will get us the answer and let's just do a problem that we can readily understand. And you'll see that this really does work. We've spent some time deriving these formulas, but if, if that blows your mind, it's okay. Just memorize this. 41 over seven, find the permutation of 12 things taken four different ways. Okay, we can solve that with boxes super easy, but let's not do it. Let's figure it out using this formula. Write this one in your cover. Go ahead and do it because this one's got easy numbers, but if we had crazy numbers, we would want this. So it's going to be 12 factorial over 12 minus four factorial. Remember, this is always the N and that's the R, okay? So I just use this formula with these values, plugged it in, let's see what we get. I'm gonna do the denominator first. 12 minus, minus four is eight factorial. So this will be 12 times 11 times 10 times nine times eight factorial. And look, this all makes sense, right? Because I, I want that, I know the eight factorial needs to be on the bottom. That's the 12 minus four, eight factorial. I know I want these to cancel. So that tells me I should be stopping at eight factorial here. All right, well, I have to start at 12 because that's my, my n value. So I just started counting down, right? 12 times 11 times 10 times nine. And then I got to the eight factorial that I chose based on that, right? Now these guys cancel and my final answer is 12 times nine times 10 times eight, which turns out to be, I'll just tell you what it is. It's 11,880. But look, if we did this the old fashioned way, how cute that our earlier lessons are already old fashioned. 12 things taken four at a time, we would have just done this, right? 12, 11, 10, nine. So this formula, which we derived through this complicated process, will get us to the same answers as our picture drawing mythology does. We wanna start using this though because the numbers will get bigger and crazier and we don't wanna deal with it. So I'm going to, I, write, I tend to forget this one, so I'm gonna write it down right here. P, the permu number of permutations of n things taken r at a time equals n factorial over n minus r factorial. Make sure you get the parentheses on that because you subtract it first and then do the factorial. That's a good one. And that is the number of ways to take n things r at a time. Okay, that's what that represents, the number of permutations. Okay. Guess what? We're finally done with this lesson. Are you exhausted? It was a it was a big bad boy. All right. On to lesson 42. See you next time.